Hello again. So during the mid 19th century, massive immigration into England caused overcrowding in a significant um, economic underclass. Endemic poverty led many women to solicit themselves as prostitutes. Whitechapel in London was at the heart of the problem with an estimated 1,200 prostitutes and 62 brothels. On Friday, August 21st, 1888, Mary Ann Nichols' body was discovered. Her throat had been slit and her abdomen had been dissected. Right around the same time, four other brutal murders followed hers, including slit throats, abdominal dissections, organ excisions, and face mutilations. Six other murders around that time period looked suspiciously similar. The killer was never caught and remains a mystery to this day. So do you know who we're talking about? This killer is only known as Jack the Ripper. Now, this type of a crime um, back then perhaps has gone uh, has gone on as this mystery. But today, crimes like this, typically we have, we're able to go in now with forensic um, evidence and forensic ways of looking at the evidence at the crime scene and gather evidence that can then be used to figure out who the murderer is. And this is because now we have the ability to go in and use biological samples that are left behind from both victims and from suspects and figure out and match these things together to figure out you know who was at the scene who wasn't and so forth so many uh, of course our bodies are every are made up of cells and all of the cells have DNA so you can get DNA from teeth from bone from hairs from blood from saliva from semen and so for many um, uh, many crimes that occur for example if there's a rape that occurs and the perpetrator leaves behind semen, then it's very easy to grab those cells and take the DNA from those cells. And then we have a, essentially a marker with which we can take those, those cells and match them against other possible uh, suspects. And if we do the match, we can then say, oh, well, you're the one that, you know, that committed this crime. And, and this is the way that a lot of DNA forensic science is done. Of course, you're, many of you are familiar with this with all of the popular CSI um, TV shows that are on. So um, we're not going to get too deep into this, into this uh, um, problem right now, but I do want to bring up something that, that this is the way that in which you match up the DNA from one um, you know, from a biological sample to a person. And it's done with what we call short tandem repeats, or STRs. So imagine there's a crime scene DNA, and you go and you grab the cells, and so you get the DNA from this crime scene. And you may look across a particular stretch of DNA where there are these short tandem repeats. So a short tandem repeat are usually these very short letters of DNA that are repeated over and over and over again. So right here we're looking at the short tandem repeat A-G-A-T. And in this particular person, it's repeated one, two, three, four, five, six, seven times. Now in the real world, these things can be hundreds of a repeat um, tandem repeats long. Now in the suspect, so let's say that this is, you know, this is um, from the crime scene, this is uh, a semen sample. And so they have a suspect and they say, we think that he's the one that committed the crime. They can go into the suspect's DNA and for that exact same stretch of, of DNA, they can look at the, the number of tandem repeats. And so they go and look at these tandem repeats for the AGAT region. And they go, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So there's seven, the same as the crime scene. So you start to say, ah, this is evidence supporting that this person committed the crime. However, you can then look at a different STR site. And this one is a GATA repeat site. And so here at the crime scene DNA in this in this you know, um, example where we're saying, okay, this is semen from a rape victim. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight short tandem repeats of the GATA repeat. Yet in the suspect, there is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. So they don't match up. And this can be done across many, many different STR sites. In fact, um, right now, for most forensic analyses that are done, they use a 13-site um, profile. And so 
once you get the crime scene sample and match that up against a suspect's sample, you have 13 individual places where you are matching up. If they match up across those 13, you now have very, very strong evidence that the biological sample matches the suspect's sample. So if you compare, right, across all 13 of these sites and and you work up the statistics, what are the probabilities? You also use a database that gives you the probabilities of, of having that particular, because it may be more rare to have a 13 repeat than an 8 repeat. And so once you figure all of this out with the, with the statistics, statistics and everything, this is where you can say in a court of law with confidence, you know, there's a one in a billion chance that, that someone else could have matched this profile. And then you match that against, you know, what's the probability of that particular population and where this occurred and all of the other stuff. And this is how you can essentially um, find guilt in, in um, suspects. And, and therefore, forensics, DNA forensics, becomes a very powerful tool in trying to figure out some of these cases. So I want to break from the forensics and come back to the cell cycle for just a moment. Recall that in the cell cycle we have this S phase. And during the S phase, that's when DNA synthesis or chromosome duplication is carried out. Now, we take advantage of what we've learned about the biology of how chromosomes are duplicated. And we can use this in crime scenes because let's say that you find a tiny, tiny, tiny little drop or, or one little hair, right? You can actually use that small amount of biological sample and go in and with our knowledge now we know how to replicate DNA. We know how to mimic what happens naturally in the body and so we can actually make as many copies of that particular region of DNA that we need to and then we can do all of the forensic DNA analysis that we need to. You know we can go and count the STRs and do all the other stuff. So um, for the for the rest of this lecture then I want to talk about how it is that chromosome duplication is carried out. And to do this, we're going to go back kind of historically and look at one of the major um, experiments that discusses this, um, how, how this was figured out. So here is what we call the Messelson and Stahl experiment. Those are the last names of, of the investigators who looked at that. So what they did is they start out, out with some E. coli, some bacteria, but these bacteria were being grown in a medium that had nitrogen 15. So regularly nitrogen has 14, right? But in this case, they were growing it in a little bit heavier nitrogen, had an extra proton, proton okay? All of the, 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 um, all the atoms of nitrogen were a little bit heavier. So that, that's what they did first. So they grew up a bunch of bacteria. So all of their DNA was incorporating a little bit heavier nitrogen, nitrogen 15, instead of the regular nitrogen 14. Okay. Then they took a sample from this and they um, brought that sample over into the, a medium that now had nitrogen 14. And they let those, um, they know how long it takes for those bacteria to go through one generation. So they allowed these bacteria to grow for one generation and then they pulled out a sample from that generation. So now we've got a sample of DNA of of the bacteria from this generation. So we've got from this generation and this generation. Then they let it go one more generation, to, so to a third generation, and they pulled out a sample. So now we've got samples from generations 0, 1, and, and 2. And then they busted open the cells and allowed just DNA to be present in these samples. Then they took these samples and they put them in what's called a centrifuge. And in this centrifuge, they spin this down at really high speeds. Things that are heavier go further towards the bottom and things that are lighter go a little bit higher, right? So it's a way of separating things based on their mass. And here were the results. When they, the parental sample had one band, and I've colored the band now just so that it's easier for you to see, but the blue bands are going to refer to the heavy nitrogen and the red bands will refer to nucleotides that contain the regular nitrogen uh, 14. And so what they saw is that there was just one band uh, um, further down in the vial. The first replication vial had about, had about halfway up um, a band, and then the second replication vial had 
a higher a higher band and then that same um, a band at the same place as the first replication vial. Now, based on these results, we can um, we can should be able to tease out what's happening with DNA. Now, there were three working models that um, and the investigators had. The first one's called the conservative model. And this is where when you replicate DNA and make a new, you know, sister chromatid, you make a new chromosome over here, that, that you basically are copying one chromosome and making a, diff a new chromosome. But both strands of the new chromosome um, are new and both strands of the old chromosome are from the original DNA, or from are the, both strands um, on this first replication, though, are just the original DNA, okay? And so if you bring this down to the second replication, then you would have one band or one chromosome that, are both, that contain both of the strands from the original DNA, and then you would have three chromosomes that are all new um, DNA that was made, right, from the nitrogen-14 um, growth medium. In the dispersive model, the idea is that the DNA kind of it, it's it's back and forth. It's it's using old DNA and then it sticks new DNA in, and then old DNA and then new DNA, and so it's, it gets all mixed up. But essentially, you have about half new and a half and half old and half new and half old, and so you would have about half new and half old and half new and half old in all of these all the way down. The third model is called the semi-conservative model. In this model, you basically say, okay, I'm going to take the DNA, and because DNA is make, it's double-stranded, I'm going to separate it. One of the strands will serve as a template and, the, uh, and, and get copied, and so you get one strand that's old with one strand that's completely new, the newly built strand. So you end up with an old and a new, and an old and a new, 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 in, in each of these, right? And you can see that how that pattern works out relative to the nitrogen-15 DNA to the nitrogen-14 DNA. So let's go back to our results. This is what we saw. So in the parent DNA, we saw, again, just the dark, the, the heavy, um, only nitrogen-15 strands um, coming down to the bottom. So that matches up to all three models. At that starting point, all three models match up fine with that. Then we go to the first replication point where everything kind of was right in the middle. And that then does, that rules out immediately the conservative model. Because in the conservative model, we should have seen a band down here and, um, and then another band. So we should have seen two distinct bands, not just one band. Um, the dispersive model and semi-conservative model, it's kind of what we'd expect, right? They're about half blue, half red. Each chromosome is about half blue, half red. So you would expect them to all kind of be in the same place. So we can then, therefore, because the first replication does not have two bands, then we can rule out the conservative model as being correct. So let's look then at the second replication bands. Up here, again, we have now two distinct bands. And if we come down and look, we see, oh no, the dispersive model doesn't work now because it should have still just had one band because every chromosome is just starting to have, again, you know, this kind of evenly mixed DNA from the previous generation. And so you should have had essentially a, the, the, the amount of nitrogen-15 nucleotides to nitrogen-14 nucleotides should have been the, about the same in every chromosome, and so they should have all had about the same weight, so therefore you should have had essentially just one band, but you didn't get that. So we can also rule out the dispersive model. So the correct model is called the semi-conservative model, and that's what happens during DNA replication, where you take one uh, chromosome, uh, right, one molecule of DNA, which is double-stranded, and you separate it and you use each side as a template to produce a new um, double-stranded molecule of DNA. And the way that this is done, there are a bunch of molecules and um, enzymes that are involved in replicating DNA. So one of the ones I want to point out is called primase. And primase is a molecule that lays down first an RNA primer. So you can't just start building DNA just straight DNA. You have to first lay down this little primer that's RNA. And then once you've laid down the primer, then the primer can then um, initiate and help the construction of newly made DNA. And the enzyme that does, that matches, go, matches up new DNA nucleotides to this template strand um, DNA 
uh, strand is called DNA polymerase. So, he so here we've got primase and DNA polymerase are two of the important enzymes that are used. The third enzyme that I want to point out is called helicase. So here's a different diagram. And in this case, helicase is the thing that actually goes in and separates or unzips the double-stranded DNA molecule so that now you have both um, sides of the DNA ready to be copied. But you'll also need to remember that we can only make DNA in one direction, right? You remember this from when we talked about transcription. And we can only go from 5 prime to 3 prime. And so um, you, you must then work um, in, what, in, in the leading strand. You can simply just build, 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 build. But in the lagging strand, you have to build for a little bit and then stop and then come back and then build for a little bit and then stop. And this entire process is going to be um, made a little bit more clear in the animation that you'll watch at the end of this video. But I want to point one other thing out. Because we, when we're copying chromosomes, remember chromosomes are linear. And so if you're going to try to copy this chromosome, you first have to lay down a little bit of primer and then you can start doing the DNA. Well, you can't go back and kind of backfill this little area in that you're missing. And so this is why every time DNA replicates, you lose just a little bit off the ends of the chromosomes, right? And that's why these telomeres, the ends of the chromosomes, get a little bit shorter each time. And this is, again, something that we've pointed out before, but this is one of the main reasons for aging, is that cells that are continually going through mitosis, where you have to duplicate your DNA every time that you want to divide the cell, you got to do this duplication, you're making your chromosomes just a little bit shorter each and every time. So that's a quick introduction to DNA replication, and the, the video that you'll watch will also give you a little bit more of an introduction to this process. And then we'll be able to use this as we continue to talk about um, you know, how to use DNA forensic science as well to solve crimes.